Amen. Thank you. Uh, good morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to the book of Joshua chapter 4. We are going to continue on in our series on uh, memorial stones. And what we are doing is I am simply telling lessons from our history, uh, stories of where we came from as a church and as a fellowship. And then along the way, as we're telling stories, then we're applying lessons. What are the lessons that we learned that make us what we are today? And this is a biblical uh, principle. We find this in Joshua 4. Let's read our main verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, we are uh, going to talk about commitment to the workers and the works. Major part of our uh, fellowship, if you're visiting for the first time, foundational. Our church was birthed out of the Jesus movement starting in 1970. Hippies started getting saved. God revealed the vision to our uh, founder, Pastor Wayman Mitchell. He began training men in-house in discipleship as opposed to going to Bible school. That was revolutionary. And then we've been looking at now, we started planting churches and uh, the first one was in 1973. So now a few years have uh, uh, gone by. When we started planting churches, of course we were planning for good, meaning we send couples out. We don't send couples out to fail. We don't send them out to struggle. We send them out to succeed. That is our belief that the same spirit that we have here, God can give them favor wherever they go. However, unexpected things happen. When you're starting in the process, you you have a, a, a glimmer of revelation. This is what God wants us to do is plant churches. We had no idea all that would be involved. And part of that is just unexpected things. Let's talk about three unexpected things that started happening. We'll talk about some of the first times that these happen because they're universal to this day. And the first was redirection. Not every church we plant goes well. Not every church we plant breaks out in with hundreds and thousands of people getting saved and uh, becoming powerful. That, that's, it's just life. That's part of life. Uh, there are things that workers need to learn. There are cities that, of course, are a little harder than, uh, than others. And so what happens is we send couples to a city. They begin to labor, <clears throat> but sometimes they are struggling. And there's every kind of struggle. We've had people struggle to get people in or get saved at all. And then, of course, the universal, uh, they come, but they don't come back. Or just they, they get just a handful and can't grow beyond that. Pastor Mitchell began to understand that long-term barrenness is not healthy for the worker. You have to remember, please, these are not just you know, pins or dots on a map. These are people's lives. And so he discovered this, that it's not healthy if a couple is going out and they are, now some years are going by and they're not getting people saved, the church is not growing. It's not good for them. So what began to happen in one of the early churches that we planted in Cottonwood, it was the first time we tried in, in uh, Cottonwood, uh, it did not go well. And so uh, the attitude things come up and they, it's, it's human nature. Sometimes people blame the pastor, blame the church. Uh, just there are things that are struggling. It was not going well. And so what has to happen is either 
the pastor sees this is not good for this couple to stay there. We, it doesn't, doesn't do us any good that we have you know, numbers, but then these people are dying spiritually. And then sometimes you have couples that quit. In this case, the couple uh, wanted to quit. It was the very first couple that we ever brought back for redirection. That's the term that we call it. We are redirecting them into uh, ministry. But here, I want you to listen to me. This is absolutely foundational to who we are. As a church, we are committed to the workers. This is incredibly important. Remember the difference between a denomination. A denomination is centralized. So the people who decide who goes out or who becomes pastors and where they go may not actually know these people at all. Their names, they're essentially a number. I'm not saying that, that that's evil. It's just the reality. When you create a, a centralized organization, the people are not known. They're not connected. And so when couples are struggling, that often there's not perhaps a quick response. Sometimes it's because it's a machine, it moves slowly. When we send couples, they are family. The workers that we send, they're precious to us. This is, this is like sending your children. So if they're struggling, that's not, that's not just, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna wreck our numbers if you uh, uh, come back. We are committed to the workers. We're committed in numbers of ways, and we'll probably talk uh, later on about financial support in general, but one of the things, when we send couples out, we financially support them to get there. We financially support the work so it gets off the ground. And in this case, we're talking about trouble. If the work does not go well and the couple needs to come home, we are committed to them. We also make a financial commitment. We don't just leave people, say, be blessed, be warm, be filled, be gone, and let us know how it goes. There are people, they gotta, how are they going to get back? And then they're going to come back. They need to get a job. So a commitment we make. And so we call it redirection because we're not saying it's over. It may be some couples just simply need to get healed up. They've been getting beat up for a couple of years or whatever, however long it's been. They just need refreshing. They need to get healed up. Sometimes they're not thinking straight. And sometimes they need to learn some things and all of that. Here's the problem is that the devil messes with workers' heads. There are people that they don't process redirection well because they view it as I am a failure or I have let you down or you know the pastor of the church they must be angry at me because they put all that money and they uh, didn't uh, uh, it didn't work very well that is absolutely not how pastor Mitchell viewed it he had a very healthy perspective redirection is a step it's not the end. This is based on Psalm 37, 23, and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Okay, look at that scripture. It tells us two very powerful things about serving God, doing anything for God. Number one, life is made up of steps. You don't make one giant leap into massive destiny. Steps, sometimes those steps involve, you know, things that don't go well. It's just a step. That's how Pastor, he doesn't look at, he never looked at anybody like, you failed, you're a terrible person. He, remember the old saying uh, that you heard Pastor Mitchell say many times? He used to say, Greg, sometimes you get the bear and sometimes the bear gets you. Now, in the last few months, we had a guy up in the woods there. The bear got him. That takes on a... <laughs> Life is like that. That's just how dad viewed it. Is sometimes you don't always win steps. Anything you're experiencing in life is not final. It's a step. The second thing, though he fall. 
you do not rise to unending success in anything in life. Sometimes things don't go well. So dad had a very healthy perspective. He said, this is a process, come back, get healed up, get, learn some things maybe, and then we'll tackle it again. That's exactly what happened. The first couple that came back for redirection, got healed up, learned some things, were sent out again, and they found fruitfulness in another place. So the first unexpected thing, remember, we have no map for church planting. This was totally new redirection. The second thing that can happen is tragedy. One of the things you learn in life is bad things happen to good people. Even if you do right, serving God does not give you holy immunity from all trouble. Bad things happen to good people. You can't see this coming. One of the things in the early days of our fellowship where we learned this principle was in a man called John Metzler. John Metzler was a friend of my father's. They went to Bible school together in Los Angeles. John Metzler, very influential in the early days, absolutely supernatural uh, uh, touch of God. And uh, he held the breakthrough revivals in our church, in other churches, tremendous uh, man of God. After a few years, John Metzler wound up pioneering a church with our fellowship in the North Phoenix area. I think it may have even been like originally in Paradise Valley, but essentially North Phoenix. We got some pictures of John Metzler and uh, that's one of the early flyers on the left. There he is on the right. John was always a flashy dresser and, and uh, he, was, he was a lot of fun uh, to be around. John Metzler was preaching a revival in Sedona, Arizona. How many of you have been here long enough to remember we used to have a church in Sedona? Very strange place for a church. It's a wealthy, there's millionaires there. I, I remember right after I got saved, I went on an impact team there and handed out a flyer for a free movie and a woman who obviously she had jewels, she was a woman of wealth, she looked at me and said, why would I attend a free movie? <laughs> so, but anyway, Flagstaff had planted a, a church in Sedona. John Metzler, who was pastoring in Phoenix, was driving back and forth from Sedona uh, each night in, in this revival. And this was in December of 1978. One night he took four people with him from his church and they drove from Phoenix to Sedona. Very interesting story intertwined in what I'm about to tell you. There was a lady from Sedona that night that attended, would not answer the altar call. Someone dealt with her to get saved. She refused and would not. Service ended. John Messler gets in the car with the four people from the church. Unbeknownst to him, this lady who happened to attend was for some reason also driving uh, to Phoenix. There was a terrible storm going on at that time. When they, when they build bridges and structures, engineers, they, they engineer it for, to withstand what they call a hundred year flood. What's the worst amount of rain we could get in a hundred year period, what, what's in, at one time? And so they're supposed to uh, build to withstand hundred year floods. As uh, it came out later, the contractor had never seen a hundred year flood. He cheated on the foundations in a bridge crossing the Awa Fria, the I-17 as you uh, uh, cross the Awa Fria River. So now in a terrible rainstorm, there are three cars, they're right close to each other. There was an older couple completely unconnected in front John Metzler, four people in the middle, and the lady who wouldn't get saved for whatever reason, she also was driving to Phoenix. As they came up to the Awa Fria bridge, uh, River Bridge in uh, New River, Black Canyon City, the bridge collapsed. Very, very interesting story. The older couple, they were on the bridge. As it collapsed, their car flew through the air the tires hit on the other side, ripped the wheels off, 
they lived. John Metzler and the four people in the car, their car flew, but they hit and all were killed instantly by the impact on the other side and they were washed downstream. The third car, the lady who would not get saved, her car skidded down into the water and the older couple came and they saw her calling for help and the water washed her away. So this was an incredible tragedy. I'm, I'm giving now just a little side note through many years of pastoring. When people die, I often have people ask me the unanswerable question, Pastor Greg, why did they die? Why do we pray and they die? I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not God, I don't have that answer, but I often think of John Metzler, think about this. A few seconds earlier, they would have lived. Seconds later, they might have lived. It was time to go. That's the bottom line. The Bible says it is appointed to a man once to die. So this is completely unexpected. Pastor Mitchell did not plant churches and say, okay, you know, 1.7% will be killed. No, we, there's no way you can factor that in. This was absolutely shocking. So I said, concerning redirection, we are committed to the worker. Now here's the second lesson. We are committed to the work. We're committed to the church. Okay, go back to the difference between denomination. Denomination means centralized control. Remember how Pastor Mitchell came to Prescott, it was that due to a moral failure, there was no pastor. They didn't have a pastor for over three months. Why? Because it's a machine. The people making the decisions, it's not their personal church. You have someone that, I don't know what, election or appointment, they, they have a position, but they don't, it's not a personal connection with these people, so it's, it's an unwieldy uh, uh, process. This is true of denominations around the world. Sometimes they have these empty churches they're struggling to fill. But a fellowship is not centralized control. A fellowship, we join together by common cause, not by central rules, and one of the things is that every church that plants churches, okay, the worker, there are sons and daughters, they're family. The church now, we have a term, we call these our daughter churches. They're related to us. So if there is a crisis in the church, we don't say, you know what, we'll get the committee, we'll meet on that, and we're supposed to come. I think next month we might have a committee meet. No, 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 these are, this is family. And so for the very first time, Pastor Mitchell had to make a decision. We need a pastor. The pastor died, so now we need a pastor in that church absolutely as fast as possible. And so he contacted uh, Silver and Joan Gaddis from where they were, and immediately they were moved there, if I remember right, by the following Sunday after this tragedy, they were there. So Pastor Mitchell said, if we're gonna plant churches, we have to do whatever it takes. You cannot just leave churches hanging when they're reeling through whatever kind of tragedy. So church planting means you're committed to the workers, first of all, but you're also committed to the work. So we have a commitment to every daughter church that we will do whatever it takes to preserve that church. We will stand behind you and we will help you. So the unexpected number one redirection, unexpected number two um, is a tragedy, unexpected number three is crisis. So as you plant churches, you discover that for many and varied reasons, couples have to leave a church suddenly. That can be a health crisis. That can be, you know, they quit. There, I mean, there can be many, many different issues. It can be sin, and they have to be removed. But for whatever reason, sometimes you have couples that suddenly 
are leaving. This happened for the first time, not a death now. 1979, we had to make a change in Perth, West Australia. We had planted the work. It was going well. God was doing good things. And now we had to make a sudden change. And we had to send, a, we, they had a viable church. It was, if I remember right, it was uh, running to uh, uh, like 60 people. So it was a healthy church, early stages, but nonetheless, it was a self-supporting work. So the problem is we plant workers in conferences. For us, we have a conference in January, we have a conference in July, primarily. If it's not a crisis, okay, I want to go out, you know, I want to go overseas. Conference, January or July is when we deal with that. But in a crisis, we don't have that luxury, right? What happens if the crisis occurred in February and we're not having a conference till July? You can't just say to a viable church, hey, listen, they'll, uh, they'll get there eventually. We had to have a couple there and we had to have them there quickly. And so now the problem is when you plant churches internationally, everything international is much more expensive. Early days, right, we're planting church. It's Flagstaff, it's Wickenburg, it's Cottonwood. You know, hey, we'll drive over the hill. We'll be there within the hour. International is not that way is you have to, you got to buy tickets, you got to get visas, you have to move their goods. You, it is very involved. It doesn't matter. It just has to be done. And every church that is going to plant workers, you have to factor that in, that we are committed to the workers, we're committed to the works. And we've seen this through the years. This is what happens. Redirection, tragedy, crisis, we make commitments to workers and works because that is what God has called us to do. Let's talk secondly then about some church planting milestones. And now we're, we're uh, the uh, works started being planted out, the first one in 1973. Here's a milestone, we have it up on the screen. By 1977, there were 25 churches planted out, okay? We had 25 additional churches planted out. The bulk of those were from Prescott, but now we had some other workers. They started planting some workers. So think about that, 25. In four years, we had 25 churches planted out total. So we had some milestones. We started planting churches in new states. Initially, when we planted, it was within Arizona. It was Wickenburg, Tucson, Flagstaff, you know, Cottonwood, various places in Arizona. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, Foursquare originally referred to us as the Arizona Fellowship. Partly that was because of where revival broke out in Arizona. But it was also our initial church planting ventures. And, and, and again, if you have been raised in our church, you've been here for a long time, it's, no, it's completely normal. We got these guys, they used to be on drugs, they've gotten saved, now we've trained them, disciples, sent them. yeah, of course, that's what we do here. You, you have to understand Foursquare, that was like mind blowing. You, you're, you, they were just doing what a few years ago? And they're a man of God? How can that be? And then what school did they go to? They didn't. They were trained in-house. And so we started. It's natural we planted them close so we could give them support, right? It's easy. We can drive an hour over the hill to Wickenburg or, you know, three hours, whatever it took back in the day to Tucson, Phoenix, Flagstaff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, that is what we did. We could support them, so it was logical to plant them close by. But now, as works in Arizona began to thrive, Tucson did very well. Flagstaff did very well. Some churches in Phoenix. Now, we began to spread out. The first work, as I've already told you, Gallup, New Mexico. That was the very first work in 
uh, New Mexico, we planted in California. Blythe, California was our very first church in the entire state of California. And, and remember, that's just over the border. That's very close to Arizona. Uh, Gallup, as I said, Las Cruces, Alamogordo, um, some different places. So here we have a, a, a photo here. I want to show you, here's Kevin and Janet Foley here in Alamogordo, New Mexico. A church exists to this day. Here they are, they found a building. It was called The Door and it had an arrow. There it is at the door. <laughs> That's got to be a sign from God, right? <laughs> Kevin gives me that pastor joke to this day. Okay, so New Mexico. Now we're moving beyond and again, this is like, wow. It worked in New Mexico like it worked in Arizona. In 1979, we had the first church in Texas, El Paso, Texas. Paul and Linda Campo were sent from Tucson to El Paso, Texas. We have uh, photos here, their original uh, building that is there that's uh, at, at night. And of course, Spanish, a lot of Span uh, uh, Spanish speakers. So it's called The Door, La Puerta. As well, here is Freddie. Uh, I think it's Freddie Gonzalez. Very instrumental. That man on the left that uh, has his arm around Pastor Campo, if I remember right, Paul Stevens told me that he won personally a hundred people in the church. Later, he's since passed away, but very influential. So I, I want you to get this. Texas. Now we're like, that's a long way away from Prescott the church did fantastic. So the, the same thing you begin to see, it's not an Arizona thing. The first church in Colorado, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, these were uh, early works and the works began to grow in those cities as well. The first church in Utah, a worker went to Provo and then just a few months later, Mike and Mary Webb uh, went to uh, uh, Salt Lake City in Utah. I got a picture here. This is old days. Oh, this is still El Paso. That's an outreach uh, band on a truck. Here's a, a film outreach. And as you can see, they, God was helping the work in El, El Paso. Tremendous conference center to this day. Very powerful work of God. Paul and Renee Stevens, pastor now. Next photo here. This is Mike and Mary Webb. Uh, they went to uh, Salt Lake City in uh, Utah and so uh, originally that was quite shocking like you're going to send them to Mormon country but there are a lot of people there who are not Mormons and lo and behold here's an early picture there of the um, of the congregation in the very early days that church still exists and so now new states and the work of God Illinois we had a man come into the fellowship and he planted a church in Sparta, Illinois. Got a photo here that I like. Here, that is Terry Haynes. In early days, I used to ask Terry, he had to give me proof. He looks like a dentist now, so I don't believe that you really were a sinner. And so, okay, I believe you now. But here he was, this is uh, early days, uh, may, might even be before he got saved, but next photo. And now here, then Sparta, shortly after that as well, Marion, Illinois, we have churches in both of these. There is Terry Haynes now, who pastors the church in what's now Carbondale, Harry Hills, he was the first one to pioneer in Sparta. Dad, Joe Campbell, who uh, then pioneered in Marion, Illinois, and this was uh, one of their early uh, conferences that they did. So again, Illinois is a long way from Arizona, but it didn't matter, is if you do what we do here, if you want to be what we are, if you do what we do, then God will help you exactly the same. We had the first work planted in Guam in the Marianas Islands. Flagstaff planted a work in Guam. This did not go well, but it was, it was quite revolutionary to another nation. That was, I think, their first international uh, church plant. Didn't go well, but it broke ground. And we got some 
photos of Guam. This, I'm, I'm just showing you on a map. Guam is way, way out there. And so the work of God, the first church planting venture didn't go well. Later on, then uh, it went very well. Powerful church planting center. Uh, next photo, here's Guam. It's a very small island, but uh, very, very powerful work of God. That was there. Then we, in, in church planting, you often will talk about this. There often are logical reasons why someone will go. I want to go to my hometown. The, the guys who went to Illinois, that's where they're from. So their heart was, I want to go to my hometown. Pastor Mitchell was approached by a, a couple here in the Prescott Church uh, who had been out pastoring and said, we want to go to Germany. So the very first church in Germany, now again, and our conference, we're starting to plant not just domestically in the U.S., but we planted. I have an old trumpet. Uh, I didn't have a photo. But here, the second church planned for Europe. Remember I told you last week uh, uh, about Holland, or the last time we had a lesson, Holland, which came about supernaturally. Now here is the second church in Europe, and we're planting it deliberately. We sent Don and Liz McPherson uh, to uh, go to West Germany in uh, Wiesbaden, is uh, where they originally were, were attempting to uh, pioneer. So that was the very first. So these are milestones. And again, so now you're talking about ordinary people. The, the, the beauty of church planting that is indigenous from within. So this is what happens. If you're in an organization and they're talking about, we have missionary in Papua New Guinea and Africa and Outer Ubangi and you know, wh where else, that's, that's exciting, your heart is stirred. But when you're planting from within, there are people here like, I know that guy. He's gonna be a mission, they're gonna be missionaries. So it is much more stirring because now it's not unattainable. It's like, I was saved with that guy. We could do this. That is, the, that is the brilliance of the vision that God gave us, planting churches from within. Sometimes this work, if I remember right in, in uh, Wiesbaden, didn't go well. But the idea is it's very stirring. We are going to reach the world with people like us. Not professionals that we went and got from a school or they applied for the best qualified candidate. People like us could reach the world. So those were some milestones. Then church planting also, it has some, uh, on any level, it has some organic elements, meaning from within. I know organic, when you're at the store, that's a French word that means cost twice as much. But we're talking now in a church, organic is, uh, that means from within. So as people got saved in Prescott, let, let's just apply it to Prescott now, or, or in Arizona, some of the churches in Arizona. Remember what was happening in the, in the Jesus movement? Hippies were traveling, they're hitchhiking. They're roaming all across America. So we had people getting saved in our churches that were not from here. They had been hitchhiking through town. They were visiting someone and they got saved here. If someone gets genuinely saved, what do they do? People who get saved want to pray and they want to witness. So what do they do? It's natural that you pray for where you're from and that you witness to people back home. This happened, Michelle Greeley uh, was uh, here, now it's Michelle Olson. She had come to uh, Prescott, going to uh, Prescott College and got saved and Michelle began writing letters home. She would send letters and witness to people back in Massachusetts, I mentioned this, and early days, I think Bruce Cutter counted up, it was like 36 people, whatever it was, that from their little communities right next to each other, Hamilton, Wenham, uh, you know, this all outside of uh, the Boston area, that they started getting saved. And 
some of them moved here and got saved. Some are in our church, like Bruce Cutter, still in our church today. Um, different ones are, are still here. But others got saved, but it's just not feasible for them to move here. So what's a natural part of church planting is people begin to say, we need a church where I'm from. So they're praying, they're lobbying the court of heaven saying, God, we need a church in my hometown. So we had a whole group of people from Massachusetts who were praying, we need a church in Massachusetts. Philippians 1.5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, he is... The Apostle Paul is talking about a church that he planted, and, and he's saying, your fellowship, that is what we are. Fellowship literally means partnership. We partner together to do God's will. If you pray for a city for God to plant a church there, you become a partner in everything that God does there. And so... People had been asking God to send a church, probably bothering Pastor Mitchell, but nonetheless, is, here's a milestone. The very first church on the East Coast, Mark and Jane Ann Hurley, were sent to Beverly, Massachusetts. This is 2,000 miles away. So now, this is a big deal. We're not going to be able to just pop over the hill and give them a band and an impact team. We are trusting God with this couple, and we're trusting God. God, you're the same God in Massachusetts than, than you are here. We got a photo again. Uh, here is the original uh, blurb in the trumpet. Arizona Fellowship extends to the East Coast. And this was the very first church that we planted in the East Coast. The furthest we had gone, Texas, Illinois, was as far as we had gone up and, and to that point. I think we have another photo. Uh, next photo. Yeah, Mark and Jane Ann Hurley, they were the ones they were from there. It was natural to, uh, uh, for, to go back where they're from, and a church was planted. Also, at the same time, Harold Warner had gotten saved in Prescott. Harold wasn't from here. Harold was a blue blood from the uh, East Coast in Massachusetts. His mother lived in the Cape Cod area. His mother got saved. Some of her friends had gotten saved, and they began praying we need a church in Cape Cod, and they began lobbying Harold, we need a church in Cape Cod. Paul and Renee Stevens were pioneering in San Bernardino, California, and it was not going well. And so Paul said we were dying, and so we approached Pastor Warner, and we said, can we come home? We're all done, it's not working, we're discouraged. And Pastor Warner said, how about instead of coming home, why don't you go to the Cape? There are people there who need a church. Why don't you go to the Cape? And so Paula Renee Stevens went. This was the second church that we had on the East Coast. And uh, so we have some pictures here. Early days, uh, here is Paula Renee uh, getting sent out. I don't remember if that is literally the one where they went to. Uh, the Cape, or an earlier one, but nonetheless, here is an uh, article in uh, the Cape and Islands News uh, talking about the church, and you've got to understand the Cape had never seen anything like this. There were no churches like this in the Hyannis and Cape Cod uh, area. Is There was a, a lady uh, in the church, Saber Stockdale, was friends with uh, Mrs. Warner, and so they had their very first service in the living room, had about 30 people in their very first service, simply because people praying, people witnessing, they're partnering, and uh, they, uh, the, the church took off uh, from there. That is a conference center today. The other thing is that not only praying for uh, a city, God may put a city on your heart that you might never go to, but he wants you to partner in prayer, but then you have people that they have a burden for the place they're from. Uh, 1983, Eric and Brenda Strutz were planted from Tucson, Arizona into Rochester, New York because he was from Rochester. So churches are planted in many different ways. This is a natural burden. I wanna go where I'm from. 
People need Jesus. I don't have a picture of them as a couple. I'm struggling for photos, but I will show you a photo here. There is Eric on the right. I don't know if he wants me to show that photo, but that was him. Uh, <laughs> but that is Ray Ruby, Jose Urbina, and the late uh, Jesus Vesera, all uh, men of God from Tucson. And uh, they responded, and that church is in Rochester, New York, to this day. So these are milestones. The next milestone is that our international churches, they started planting churches. So Prescott, we sent the worker in, um, in, oh, into Nogales, trying Nogales, Arizona. In fact, actually opened in Mexico over the border. Pastor both for a while. So then, after uh, a few years, a Mexican took over the church in Nogales. Uh, Sergio Gaiola took over the Nogales Sonora Church. Then, remember I told you we had uh, a young man who had gotten saved here in Prescott. He was illegal. Uh, came into Prescott in the early days. Uh, not a great place to hide in Prescott in those days. And so he went back. Uh, at that level, Mexico wasn't quite ready to fully support. And so we partnered and uh, we sent Cruz and Terry Guerrero into Obregón, uh, Mexico. I have a, a picture of, these are some of the early workers. Uh, on the left, if I remember right, that is uh, Jose Luis Gaiola. Uh, that is him on the left. The other brother, I, next one I can't remember, that is Sergio Gaiola. That's his brother, who is the pastor in Nogales. Ruben Reña was a, a pastor who affiliated with our fellowship at that time. Uh, from California, and that's Cruz Guerrero on the right. These were early converts, some of them early, and uh, uh, most of those went out and began to pastor. 1978, now uh, Nogales had, had sent a worker in partnership with Tucson. I told you about Agua Prieta, and then Obregón, those are partnership. 1978 was a milestone. Nogales planted their first organic church, meaning a Mexican couple, and they're going to pay for it from Mexico. This was a very early discussion Pastor Mitchell had. The worker that originally went there wanted Pastor Mitchell to open up businesses, you know, chicken farms and different things so they could have money. And Pastor Mitchell said, nope, the will of God is indigenous. Mexicans have to give in their currency, and they have to plant churches from within, 1978, they did that the very first time. Jose Luis and Lucy Gaiola were sent to Las Mochis. We have a picture of the Gaiolas here. Here they are, a mighty mustache. He has more hair in his mustache than I have on my head. Uh, but, but they were the very first Mexican worker paid for from the church in Nogales. So the indigenous principle that Pastor Mitchell believed in, here is proof it worked. It worked in Mexico, and then they also planted churches, Hermosillo, Agua Prieta, Mexicali, San Luis, Tepexpan. These were early works there. Some of these cities were originally, Jack Harris was doing miracle crusades, and uh, natural result, people getting saved. We wound up planting churches there. 1981, the last uh, 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 church we're going to talk about is Perth, we planted that church in 1978. In 1981, Perth planted their first church in a, in a small town up the coast called Geraldton, Geraldton, West Australia. A man named Lynn Litton had actually been saved in Prescott. Lynn Litton is Ron Burrell's half-brother. He was saved in Prescott originally. Process of time, he wound up moving to Australia ostensibly to help uh, Ron and Susie establish the church. And so Perth now was exploding in growth. And so Lynn and Linda Lytton were sent to uh, Geraldton, West Australia. Geraldton was chosen. In those days, we were working very closely. We were Foursquare. We we're working with them. West Australia has a one big city, Perth, and then it's small towns. And so Geraldton, there was no Foursquare Church, so we could plant a worker there and not, you know, have a territorial fight. They rented, they had the first impact team, they rented the city town hall 
over 200 young people showed up. They had probably 25 to 26 say. We have some pictures of the early. Here's uh, Lynn and Linda Litton and the family. As I said, Lynn was saved here in Prescott. Next photo. This is the original concert. Here it is, 200 young people in a hall that they rented downtown. Next, uh, next photo, here is the altar call. Uh, uh, people talking at the altar afterwards. Uh, there in the red in the middle, that's Paul Graham, a young Paul Graham there. A uh, man named Mike White, different people that my wife and I uh, know that were there on the impact team. But that was the opening concert. Daryl Elliott told me, Five of those that got saved in the very first concert wound up becoming pastors or pastor's wives in the future. It was just supernatural from day one. After three months, the church was running 60 people. Got a, a picture of the early church. Next one. Here is the early church. It's only months old at this point in time. Somewhere in there is Daryl and uh, Jillian Elliott who are now the leaders uh, of Australia. Uh, he went off support. The church was fully self-supporting at the seven month mark. They had their own building. The pastor was full time. And then we have a later picture there here. The church began to grow. So now this is the other side of the world. All they're doing, Lynn Litton was doing what he had seen in Prescott, Flagstaff, in the church in Perth, and it worked exactly the same. God did this. It wasn't an American thing. This was clearly a heavenly thing that it worked. Uh, there, Daryl Elliott told me, he said, in, he looked at his yearbook from high school. He said in two years, 1981 and 82, he said he counted up over 100 people from the senior years of just those two years that got saved in 81, 82. It was supernatural, that work of God in Geraldton. And Daryl made the comment, the potter's house brought the Jesus revolution to Geraldton, West Australia, in the early 80s. Last uh, two milestones before we close. Next, we'll put it up on the screen. Now, by 1980, this is only 70 year, uh, 70, seven years after we started planting by 1980, we now had 75 churches planted out, meaning not from Prescott. Prescott planted, now Tucson's planting, Flagstaff is planting, Mexico's planting, Australia, Perth is planting. 1980, that's a milestone, there were 75 churches besides us. We also had two men come in that they were not a part of our fellowship, they were already saved, they were already pastoring, but they came in because they heard what God was doing. Mike Neville uh, uh, came in and uh, began to come to conferences, associate. Uh, Ruben Rania began to associate, come to conferences. Pastor Mitchell asked nothing of them, just answered their questions, showed them what to do. They began planting churches, that's not included. There were also other works that they planted that were in addition to those 80. So God was really, really moving. The last milestone, by, in 1980, the first fourth generation pastor was sent out. Okay, now let's put up a photo here. Now think about this. Pastor Mitchell is the first generation. We sent a worker, someone got uh, sent to Flagstaff, second generation, and now I have a here on the left, Ron Simpkins, he was the third generation. He was sent to uh, Payson and originally pioneered it. I have Glenn Cluck in the middle because Glenn Cluck wound up taking over uh, from him. Glenn was uh, already saved, Glenn and Donna came in. But now, Glenn then, who was going to move on somewhere, Dave and Debbie Stevenson were saved in the church. Dave Stevenson saved, trained in-house, became a pastor. Dave Stevenson was the first fourth generation. So now this is not just something, if you're directly connected to Prescott, it works. No, it moved on to the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. 
Those are milestones. So what we begin to see is that this, it will work anywhere in the world. The last thing before we close here, I, I've told you about my dad's Bible. I want to show you another. My dad's Bible is a li living legacy. You'll see here, uh, and this is Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. Cast your bread upon the waters and you will find it after many days. And he has a note there. Mills, that's Dick Mills, the evangelist Dick Mills, gave him this as a word. Dick Mills would give a scripture and he would say this is going to be the mark of either your personal ministry or of your church. And he said this is going to be the mark of the Prescott Church. He said this in 1975. We only had a couple of churches out. But that man saw into the spiritual realm and he said, the mark of the Prescott Church is you're going to be casting bread upon the waters. And that is true. Any of you, you saw a conference. We have special speakers. We have people who come here and you get to meet them because we have done that since 1973. We cast and cast and cast and cast bread upon the waters. Conference is wonderful when we see them return. We see the word of God when you see things like that, this is why Pastor Mitchell would say again and again, this is not a work of man, it's a work of God. It's not something a man thought up. This is what God has revealed, and this is where our mission of church planting came from. God bless you, we'll stop there, and the service will start at 1030.